we started this initiative learning at home and that's why we are reaching all of you um with important topics and this uh, prevention of money laundering act is a very 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 important subject and for those who are young who have not gone through with this act it requires a lot of technical uh, expertise we had done our first session on bail under the uh, special laws relating to economic offenses by mr vikas power senior advocate uh, first of all i must uh, thank you all for joining in and uh, before i go to the subject i have few words for mr ajay varma mr ajay varma is uh, the backbone behind these all webinars and all these interesting subjects which are being chosen are his brain child okay. and he's a person who is very internationally renowned not only that he also takes care of so many public interest litigations and so many of uh, jail related matters of the inmates of under trials or uh, uh, convicts i mean it's uh, he's given his uh, his quite a lot of experience of his practice is related to all of this and he's doing a wonderful job for the society as well as for the fraternity as well as for the people who are quite uh, aggrieved with the system and not getting justice not coming out of jails and i really congratulate him for uh, all the wonderful job what he is doing and secondly uh, i will also uh, like to welcome you all and uh, first of all like, let me all, uh, wish you all a safe uh, time right uh, uh, as of now because uh, of the pandemic we are all going through and uh, i will request everyone to be staying safe stay home avoid uh, any kind of uh, unnecessary meetings with people i mean we are i am conscious of the fact that we all are waiting uh, very badly for the courts to open but as you all know that uh, courts are one place where lots and lots of people come and come together and because of the air conditioning and so many i think a lot of things are being taken care of by our management uh, executive committee as well as honorable chief justice and the other honorable judges so guys we have to wait for some time and so what better than to utilize this opportunity of sitting at home to uh, go through one of the most uh, technical and important uh, act which is doing rounds these days and it is the most uh, applied of act in these situations today we are in because of the lot of scams which have come in lot of uh, money laundering which has come in and so uh, it is uh, it is important for all of us being all students of law lawyers with experience of one month one year 10 years 20 years to understand about this act so coming to uh, my if you see the uh, post that you all received i have uh, Uh, mentioned there it is understanding it is not that i am going to give you a lecture on a particular aspect friends you are all professionals correct so we have all gone through rigors of uh, law and we have uh, we been practicing here so my subject is understanding of pmla prevention of money laundering act now what by understanding what i mean is i am sure like me when i started understanding this act lot of things in this act were rocket science for me like uh, understanding this act itself is a very uh, interesting subject as well as a very technical subject why do i say that pmla as we all know is a complete code in itself now what i mean by this complete code in itself it's a special act it's a complete code in itself complete code means this particular act has it's all provisions pertaining to search seizure arrest investigation complaint and all officers who are empowered there are all directors and deputy directors authorized by the director and when they file a complaint it goes to a particular designated court and then the designated court adjudicates on the complaint and before that all proceedings whichever happen pertaining to any offense in this pertaining to this act is already given in this act we don't have to go out of this act to crpc or any other provisions of law or any codes or anything else except for the schedule which is mentioned along with that which is the offense then this act comes into play now i'll make it a little more simpler what i mean to say is this act is a complete code in itself it has its own directions its own provisions which we follow 
religiously we cannot go beyond that they cannot be interpreted in our own manner they have to be interpreted in the manner the legislature has given its intent now coming to the act here you see the introduction to this act is very little this uh, in uh, in late 90s there was a lot of uh, money laundering pertaining uh, going around in this world and uh, as you all know it was used in terrorist purposes so i mean also that people were taking bribes all around and some safe havens were made so a lot of countries were affected by the economy parallel economy being run by the people who were involved in money laundering so what happened a uh, preposition started coming up all over the world you and got involved few countries got involved contracting states came together all right let's propose a legislation so late, as late as 1999 the legislature came uh, the bill was announced but in 2002 finally our parliament passed the act but interestingly even after passing of the act in 2002 it only came into operation in july 2005 my friends these are a little background to the pmla why this act was bound sound to be necessary and if you really want to understand what all uh, un resolutions were passed what are, what are, what are the contracting states i will not take much of your time for you guys on here you guys can uh, under uh, see the book uh, the bear act and there on in the preface will find the object of the pre of uh, the money laundering act and why it came into operation what was the need of this act to come in and why uh, the entire world was getting affected by pmla uh, the money laundering thing and how the parallel economy was being run by the people who are involved into all this now coming back to uh, the act the definitions which i would like you guys to understand now when i say understand we i'll take you guys through the important definitions which are the core which are the basic structure of this act now the first definition which i want you guys to look into is which is the absolute necessity of this act which is called proceeds of crime this is section 21 small u of the pmla if you have see if you can see on your screens please you can just have a look at this please it says any property derived or obtained directly or inter- indirectly by any person as a result of criminal activity relating to a scheduled offense or the value of such property or where such property is taken or held outside the country then the property equivalent in value held within the country or abroad now this is a very important definition if you see the section 21 u why i started with seeds of crime because money laundering which is described in section 3 of the act describes that some whoever commits money laundering whoever uses or uh, further conceals proceeds of crime this is one word you will keep in mind whenever we are dealing with this act this is a very important definition now friends what does this mean this means anyone who is directly or indirectly now suppose i a particularly i am directly involved or somebody else is indirectly somebody staying abroad is indirectly involved in any movement any result of a criminal activity so if you read this definition there is one another word which is called schedule offense if you see the word schedule offense you will see schedule offense is divided into three parts in this act part a part b and part c the part a of the schedule offense as described all offenses under the ipc and various other acts like ndps or like explosive substance act uipa offenses under the arms act the wildlife act and about 28 29 act which are defined in schedule of offenses so if you see the first act part a of the schedule part b of the schedule of the total value involved in such offenses 1 crore rupees the part a has ipc uipa explosive substance arms act ndps now ndps is in part if you see 
but b there you have false declaration documents which is only which goes up to offenses 1 crore or more now part c of the schedule would have offenses which are related to extortion robbery theft it is described in the schedule which is annexed along with this so what is a schedule what is the offense which we which we read in uh, proceeds of crime anyone who commits an offense in these three schedules a b and c would commit an offense under this act so this is the word schedule which i just informed you and now we go back to the definition of proceeds of crime and then i will request you to have a look at this slide section 21u which has explanation to the pmla uh, section of proceeds of crime uh, slide number 3 now this says if you read this to one uh, explanation to uh, the proceeds of crime for the removal of doubts come to explanation please next next slide next slide next slide yes for the removal of doubts it's hereby clarified that proceeds of crime include property not only derived or obtained from the schedule of offense but also yes. any property which may directly or directly be derived or obtained as a result of any criminal activity related to a schedule of offense now see anything which you derive directly indirectly from the schedule of offense so the offense of pmla is incomplete if your activity which is criminal is nature in nature is not related to the schedule of offense then pmla cannot be invoked by the authorities if you see the three limbs of section 21u we have given it uh, under here it is very important a any property derived or obtained directly or indirectly as a result of criminal activity related to schedule offense value of property i will deal with this at a later stage which is a very important subject here derived or obtained from criminal activity property equivalent in value held in india or outside where property derived from criminal activity is taken or held outside the country these three subjects i'll be taking up in a little uh, later stage so i'll request you guys to come with me to the definition of property which is the next one now property as we all know is either immovable or movable but in this particular act because of various amendments the property has been defined in various forms it's really interesting to understand the intention of the intent of the legislature when it talks about property if you just read this property word it will show you property or assets of every description whether corporeal or incorporeal movable or movable tangible or intangible and includes deeds and instruments evidencing title to or interest in such property or assets wherever located now this is a huge definition so whenever you hear a word property in the act it implies each one of the things mentioned herein now this is 21v of the pmla now interest my friends i if you see on the bottom of the slide we have given the amendment which happened in 15th february 2013 please you guys can note it the problem here is i mean i if i can you know i go on with amendments there have been several amendments we're not wasting much time on the amendments we are trying to give you the latest whatever the latest is there which is available right now so friends if you see now corporeal or incorporeal now this is a very strange meaning if not many I, even i could not understand when i first read it the corporeal is for my little knowledge means is something which has a physical form it is bodily or physical incorporeal would mean intellectual property lease or mortgage movable and immovable we all know movable is everything like jewelry cash car bond shares and everything like that immovable is land tangible anything which can be touched is tangible and intangible is like a brand now suppose tata birla they are brand they are brand names so these are the kind of uh, issues which have been covered under this act which is just phenomenal and the intent of the legislature is to cover everything which falls under this act which which they can harp on to if it involves anywhere directly or indirectly with the proceeds of crime so this is what it is all about the property now i take you guys to a word called person now section 11 and ipc as well as we all know person is a person is an individual or a person who is a firm or a concern 
please have a look at the definition of person here. Now, the definition of person is a person which includes an individual, like all of us, any individual. Now, they've not said an individual, a HUF. Now, see, the HUF means a Hindu undivided family, half divided uh, family. So they have not left that. A company, you know, company includes everything, private limited, limited. A firm, firm could be a proprietorship firm, a firm can be a partnership firm, an association of person, a body of individuals, whether incorporated or not. Every artificial juridical person not falling, falling within any of the preceding sub clauses and any agency, office, or branch owned or controlled by any of the above persons mentioned in the preceding sub clauses. Now, look at the definition of this particular word person. So, they have not left anyone. Have no doubts. You cannot take a stand that I do not fall into person, whether you're a company, a firm, a concern, a association, a HUF. They just need to attach you with the proceeds of crime. They will only feel, all right, here it is, there's offense has been reported, or I've come to know, or I have reasons to believe, and this action is started. Any Now, coming to the most important part of this act, which is called, what is investigation? Now, as we all know, criminal lawyers immediately know what is investigation. Investigation is something which is done every day by police. Please have a look at that. Section 21A. If you read this, investigation includes all the proceedings under this act conducted by director. Now, this again, you're coming under the act. Now, these directors are appointed under by section 6 of the act. Directors or any deputy director authorized by the central government in this act for the collection of evidence. Now, look at this word for the collection of evidence. So, this is investigation. Only these persons are authorized to conduct investigations. So all agencies like CBI or, or NIA, police, or any, and, uh, um, uh, any kind of investigating agency is out of this format. Absolutely. PMLA, only ED, Department of Revenue, officers authorized like director or deputy director authorized by the director. So please, investigation is so. That is what I'm saying. This particular act being a court in itself has section 21A, which says that investigation be hum hi karenge. Bahar se kuch nahi hoga. So next is the meaning of what is a director. Please have a look at that. Section 49.1. I'm sorry, I said six earlier. That is for something else. So have a look at that. Section 49.1 says they appoint directors or additional directors or joint directors, as the case may be. The government, central government, appoints them. Now, these are the people who conduct investigation and collect evidence in this particular act for all offenses under this act. So, this is these are the people who would further use the provisions when I will uh, deal with uh, attachments or notices or investigation after I finish with the uh, this particular uh, in a. Definitions. Come to the next, please. This is who's the adjudicating authority. Now, adjudicating authority means an authority which is appointed under 6 1. Now, this is the adjudicating authority where the cases are adjudicated. When the director files a complaint, it is adjudicated here. When the director issues an order of attachment for any property, it is adjudicated here. Now, this authority, obviously, you all are aware of, is com it comprises of our three members or at any given time, chair per chairperson and two other uh, members, which are all related to law, academics, and uh, uh, something related to accountancy. And the, the chairperson is of the level of a district judge. So when we come to the appellate authority of the PMLA, there the chairperson is the judge retired of the high court or an equivalent high court judge or... Uh, and the two members who have equal legal background, and which which is a, which is mentioned in uh, the act, which you guys can go through 49, and it will clear your doubts about the appointment of these uh, honourable judges. Now coming to so th coming to now, what is the offence of money laundering? So I hope this small little session which I created for you guys for the definitions now will help you coming to understand exactly what is money laundering. I request everyone to just have a look at this section again, whosoever directly or indirectly, thank you, attempts to indulge or knowingly assists or knowingly is a party or is actually involved in any process of activity connected with 
Now, see, this amendment came in 2013. Proceeds of crime, including its concealment, possession, acquisition, or use, now these four words were not there. In 2013, they were included. They were not there prior to that. Including its concealment, possession, acquisition, or use, and projecting or claiming. These two words are very good. Claiming means if I claim I have this property where I'm sitting and I have, and tomorrow it comes to be that this property has been purchased by someone who sold it to me by proceeds of crime, I might be issued a notice. Or if somebody gifts me this property, I sit as a claimant, I can be uh, called as a person, my property can be attached in uh, the issue of money laundering. It, though I have to go out and prove there that no, I am not involved, but in any case, this provision says anyone who's claiming, projecting, what do you project? A property which has been achieved, which have been uh, taken through an illegal And I say, no, this is an untainted property. You see this word. It's a negative word. It's not a positive word. So it says the person has to say that you are involved, you conceal, you possess, you acquire, you use or you project and you say and you claim that this is an untainted property, shall be guilty of offense or money laundering. So there are, this has three limbs, if you see this. We will go to the next slide. This was further amended. And have a look at this. This is the Finance Act 2 of uh, 2019, number 23 of 90. This is a very important uh, issue here. Please have a look at that. Now, this explanation was added to clarify all doubts. Now, what do they say? For the removal of doubts, it is here if I clarified that. A person shall be guilty of offense of money laundering if such person, uh, it clarified the guilty of offense money, if such person is found to have directly, indirectly attempted to indulge, attempted to indulge, or knowingly assisted, or knowingly is a party, or is actually involved in part one or more of the following processes or activity. Now, what are the following processes? Please have a look at that concealment, possession, acquisition, use, projecting as untainted property, claiming as untainted property in any manner. And the next is important. The process of activity connected with proceeds of crime is a continuing activity and continues till such time. Please understand. Till such time a person is directly or indirectly enjoying the proceeds of crime by its concealment or possession or acquisition or use or projecting it as untainted property or claiming it as untainted property in any manner whatsoever. Now, what does that mean? It means that this continues to be, it is a continuing offense. It is not an offense that, okay, I'm sitting here today. If I'm using it, it is a continuing offense. Somebody who's involved directly and indirectly possesses something which is a tainted property. I'm using it. It is a continuing offense. It only finishes when the adjudication actually happens. And it is cleared by the adjudicating authority, which we'll just come to section 6 and 8, uh, 5 and 8, once we uh, get uh, through to the, this particular definition of the uh, uh, money laundering thing. Now, it be, it's, made, it's been made so vast. Look at the amendment. It came in so, so as late as 1st August 2019 because there have been numerous judgments of various high courts which dealt with this issue of... Uh, Every Honorable High Court gave its own interpretation, which was justified because of the uh, ambiguity, because of the uh, um, little uh, vacuum in the, uh, in the, in the uh, sections, in the language of the sections, and the, uh, which enabled, uh, the, the, that is why there have been so many amendments, because the Honorable Courts passed such orders, which, the, which were going against the intent of the Act. So the legislature had to meet again and again to uh, amend this act so that it becomes foolproof and there is no ambiguity left. So that is why when you see there are so many, there are so many amendments which have come in this act from 2002. Now, my friends, everybody is very easy. It is very easy to understand what is money laundering. It's very simple to say, oh, I'm involved in money laundering. Now, if you understand what is money laundering, how does money laundering take place? Now, that is very important. I'll just take a few minutes on that. Then we go to section six and eight of the uh, PMLA. Please have a look at this slide. How does money laundering take place? 
You see, the process of money laundering generally, generally involves the following three stages. Placement, layering, and integration. Now, what is placement, layering, and integration? Placement is the beginning. Layering is the middle stage. Integration is the offense completed. A person who indulges in money laundering has to go through these three stages so that his tainted money becomes, as he claims, to be untainted money in the integration. Please have a look at a small chart. It's a small effort by us to just give you a little bit of understanding of this. Then we go to those sections. So then you will understand exactly what I'm talking about. If you see this placement, it says the money launderer who's holding the money generated from criminal activities, introduces the illegal fund into the financial system. Now, what he does is, suppose I have a package of 1 lakh, 100,000 with me. I divide it into 10,000. I make it small trenches. And I park it at less conspicuous places where in small, small banks, by purchasing a series of instruments, like I buy a bank draft, I buy a bond, I buy a, a gold bond. So I put my money in all that and into one or more accounts at another location. Suppose we are in India. This money is placed all around the world. Now, I don't want to name the countries, but as of you, we all hear from newspapers, Cayman Islands, Dubai, UK, some, somewhere else in Bahamas and all these islands where the, there is uh, tax regime is very, uh, not very strong. So this money is placed there. So when we come to, so this is what is called placement. So when from the placement, now see, as a defense lawyer, you need to understand what exactly is the, are these three layers. Because when you will start cross-examining or arguing, you should know how this money was generated, how it was uh, layered, and how it was integrated. That's the time when you understand how to do a proper argument and cross-examination of witnesses coming in. If you do not understand these three things, you will not be able to cross-examine anyone or take up an issue in higher courts for arguments because you don't even know from where the money started. You don't even know where the layering happened. So coming back to that slide, please. Placement, now layering and integration. The second thing is after placement, the person who deals with this kind of a activity goes into layering. Now the second, it's what is layering? It's a series of continuous conversion or movements of funds. What is movement of funds? Yeah, there is some surprise. I think somebody needs to switch off his mic. Well. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So, what is movement of funds within the financial banking system by way of numerous accounts so as to hide their true origin? So, what, is, what this means is this keeps on rotating from one and moving from one bank to the other. Suppose it is in Cayman, it will be sent to Hong Kong. From Hong Kong, it will be sent to London. From London, it will be sent back to South America. From South America, so that to actually completely conceal the trail, the money. So he doesn't want, the person doesn't want the trail to be seen. So this particular layering is done, which is further to conceal the funds. And it does not, it's not easy then for the investigative agencies to reach the actual source. Because at some time, why I say that is just for your little uh, knowledge, because I also learned a very hard way. Now, why I say this, there are some countries who do not cooperate with our investigating agencies. Like if we send LRs, which is called interrogatories, they are not again sending us details. They don't send back the uh, details about how the money has come to them. So there is a block. So if money has gone to one country, it goes back to the other country. There's a block because that country is not telling you from where they've got it. So here, there's a vacuum. That's why this layering is done to delete or to conceal or to wipe out all the trails of the money going here and there. Now, 
the final step of for the money launderer would be integration this is very important now what would be integration integration would be now this particular person has already processed his criminal profits through the first two stages of money laundering the launderer then moves to his third stage which the fund reaches the legitimate economy after getting inseparably mixed with the legitimate money earned through legal sources of income now the money laundered might then choose to invest the fund into real estate business ventures and luxury because now that illegitimate money has reached india it has missed its the trail is gone the launderer is sure that i my money cannot be traced and this is where the money comes into our country and it is invested into three basic things real estate business venture luxury assets such as gold diamonds which are easily sellable and sometimes they are not even traceable now that's why the benami act came into place and all these things that's something else i will not be taking you there because i want to concentrate on this particular aspect here what we are doing so i'm sure with little effort what we've done here you guys understand what is placement what is layering and what is integration and how this these are the stages of money laundering now i'll come back now here after doing the definitions after understanding money laundering after understanding what is proceeds of crime our next step is which is very important what is attachment provisional and confirmed i'll come to the next slide please if you see section 5 of the money laundering act oh, sorry of the prevention of money laundering act it defines and prescribes please understand you cannot this is a definite act it has no ambiguities it doesn't have me it has a shell it will say a person has to do this that means you have to do it now if you read this particular thing i'll cut short for you in three or four lines here now as we talked about director who are directors and deputy directors when they have reasons to believe that and that reason to believe has to be in writing please understand this that there is a material which they have and they have come to a conclusion that particular person is in possession of proceeds of crime now see you have to go back to the definition of proceeds of crime which is very exhaustive such proceeds of crime are likely are likely to be concealed transferred or dealt with in any manner which may result in frustrating relating to confiscation of such proceeds of crime he may this is important please underline this by an order in writing provisionally attach such property for a period not exceeding 180 days from the date of the order in such manner as may be prescribed now what do we get from here if an officer who is an investigating officer comes to know about any such material in his possession there is a property or there is a proceeds of crime he issues immediately an order of provisional attachment which is to be governed till 180 days now what happens pursuant therefore we there's a proviso now what is the proviso the proviso is no such order of attachment shall be made if there is no report under 173 what do i mean by that the legislature says says if for a scheduled offense now we go back to the schedule offense of part a b and c which we discussed in the beginning those are all schedule offenses any charge sheet filed in the court for a scheduled offense pmla will come into operation the director can issue a order of provisional attachment for that proceed of crime secondly any complaint has been filed by an authorized person in the court who can investigate this matter or it is before a magistrate for cognizance of the scheduled offense again we go to part a b and c as the case may be or a similar charge sheet or complaint in the comp or in a competent on a corresponding country now let's say a proceeding starts against someone in london or a proceeding starts someone against us or a proceeding starts against someone in hong kong or whichever are the contracting states with us we can the pmla the department of enforcement can initiate the uh, process of 
provisional attachment of the properties of that particular person in this country. The next para is very important, which you must understand. These are, this is a proviso. This can be in favor of the person, but the next proviso is in favor of the government, the agencies, which say that he can also immediately attach a property. He doesn't need to wait for the charge sheet. He doesn't need to wait for any complaint to be there in the court. Just have a look at this particular proviso. Any property of any person may be attached if the director or any officer not below the rank of deputy director authorized by him has reasons to believe to be recorded writing on the basis of material in his possession that if such property involved in money laundering is not attached immediately, the non-attachment property is likely to frustrate any proceeding under this law. Now, this is completely given in Section 5. Till here, the powers have been given to the officers to uh, or pass the order of attachment. Now, this is something which we all know, uh, which, we, which we now know. Now, coming to a next paragraph of section five. Yes. This is very important. Uh, what are the safeguards prescribed under section five for this particular thing? Now, if this is not particularly given in the act. We have just uh, got this for you, for, for my friends to just have a look at that. Just have a look at it from the section itself. Attachment or these are the safeguards can be passed only by director or any officer not below the rank of deputy director and authorized by the director. The officer must record reasons to believe that any person is in possession of any proceeds of crime which are likely to be conceived, transfer or dealt with in any manner which may result in frustrating proceeding. The reasons must be based upon the material in this possession. Please understand. Now, this particular aspect, the reasons must be based. And now, at the judgment of Chandigarh High Court has come as late as March 2019, uh, 20, which has said the reasons have to be specific. I'll come on that when I, at the end of this uh, session. The officer shall forward copy of provisional attachment order along with material to adjudicate authority. How much time? He will also file file a complaint before the adjudicate authority within 30 days. So these are the safeguards. The name of the judgment which I just told you is given in the bottom of the slide. It is Seema Garg versus uh, Deputy Director of Enforcement. It's a beautiful judgment. You all must go through this judgment if you all want to actually practice PMLA. That this particular judgment defines section 5 and 8 exceedingly beautifully. It has, it has done justice to the particular interpretation of each and every word of the act. And uh, now, these are the safeguards in five. Coming back to the next one, which is, uh, we'll be dealing with this uh, in a little later. What about this? I would like you to further know what is further which happens in section five. Now, section five, we've just understood that section 5 uh, sends a complaint in 30 days to the competent authority. One more imp important thing is, if a person is in a particular property, now suppose I am sitting in this property and I get a notice of provisional attachment for my property. Nobody can ask me to get out of this property. I continue to enjoy the property. Attachment does not mean that you are thrown out. This particular provision is section 5, sub clause 4, which is a very important provision, which says, nothing in the section shall prevent the person entrusted in the enjoyment of the immovable property attached under one from such enjoyment. Yes, there is a process of possession. That is defined in section 8. We'll come there after we finish this particular section. So, the moment a provisional attachment order is passed, it is sealed in a cover and sent to the adjudicating authority. Once the adjudicating authority gets it, the investigating, the investigating officer, that is a director, is obliged to file a complaint if he wants to so that his order of attachment is confirmed or he to initiate a proceeding against the person involved in money laundering or for any offense committed under this act 
in a period of 30 days, not later than that. And with my little knowledge, I see is there is no condemnation of delay mentioned in Section 5. It has to be 30 days. So friends, coming, now this action has happened. Now, a lot of people would have this query in their mind that, okay, here, if an, I receive an order, should I wait for the adjudicating authority to call me as per Section 8? Or should I challenge this order in the higher courts? You see, the provision does not say that you challenge this order before the adjudicating authority. Yes. There are instances where the aggrieved person whose property has been attached have approached the high court in a red jurisdiction, has approached, because so far, please understand, so far it has not culminated into a criminal proceeding. So far it is a civil proceeding. So you challenge this in a civil writ before the Honorable High Court, invoking 206 and 207, so which you all know very well. And that is the only remedy which we feel is there to uh, challenge that order because the Act does not say anywhere in Section 5 that an aggrieved party or a person who is interested or who is claiming to be a person in the property can uh, file a uh, challenge in the court in the, before the adjudicator. Now, 6 and 7... And uh, I'll take you guys to section 8, which is important, which is called adjudication, which is the most important part in this act. Now, the next, uh, please have a look at these four. Uh, yeah. What is the remedy available to an aggrieved person where the proxy is provisionally attached? This is what I just spoke about it. It has been provided in the Act that before recording the finding that all or any of the property involved in money laundering, that the party has to issue a show cause notice. Now here, Section 8 says, subclause 1, the moment the adjudicating authority receives a complaint from the director, they will issue notice to the aggrieved person as well as the director which is called a show cause notice. It is mentioned in the particular uh, section. And 30 days time is given to such person calling upon. Now, please understand, we read the word person in definitions. The person is a, hell, is a huge lot of definitions. So person, you should not say it's an individual. It's everything which is mentioned in person. That person has to come back to the authority, file a reply, as to why his property is not connected directly, indirectly, or possessed, or concealed, or X, Y, Z, etc., so, etc., 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 and should be released from attachment. Now, 30 days time is given to you, to the grieved person and the director. So, if any person, like somebody else, is staying in that property and he says, no, this property is mine, I have purchased it from Mr. X, so he also gets the notice so that he can show bona fidely that, look, I did not, this money is not, my money is good. I have paid it to him. So my money is not proceed of crime. So he is also issued notice because he's sitting in that property. He's possessing that property. So the next uh, particular uh, provision which says is even joint properties which are held jointly, each joint owner is issued notice so that they can come and join the proceeding. And finally, they can move their reply. So when the reply is filed, so there are two things what the adjudicant authority will obviously will do. Number one, when it is found that this property is involved in money laundering, what will it do? When this property is found involved in money laundering, the adjudicating authority will if you read the section, I don't want to miss the word so that you can understand it better. By an order, record a finding whether all or any property is referred to, all or any. So let's say if the uh, authority has uh, uh, attached 10 properties and only three of them are involved, it will release the seven properties and it will attach the remaining three properties under the section of reward and money laundering, it will, what it will do, it will, other than person whom the notice given an opportunity, whether it decides, decides substitute that any property is involved, what will it do? 
it will further confirm the order of attachment and that order of attachment shall go on till 365 days now this is a very latest amendment it says the letter the provisional attachment will continue during investi investigation which is being done by the competent authority that is the directors in the offence and it shall go till not exceeding 365 days or the pendency of proceeding related to any offence of the act before a court let's say it's already gone to the court so the adjudicatory authority will pass an order all right i am filing an order that it shall be further confirmed for a period of 365 days pending investigation please mind that at that time if the adjudicatory authority is doing investigation the order will be only for 365 days confirming the attachment why because the adjudicating authority has to go to the criminal court within this period and this period is non it cannot be extended it cannot be extended if they don't choose to file a complaint which is called ecir if they do not file that complaint before this designated special court it will lose its case it will not get any extension so this first order is passed by the competent authority that by the sorry adjudicating authority that this order is extended and secondly which is important is it will become final after an order of confiscation is passed under 5 or subsection 7 of 8 which we will just go through or section 58 58 on this is a little about the special court the criminal trial so you have to just understand for this purpose of understanding this section that these two things are important now here when the adjudicatory authority says all right there is no case made out against you then what happens now when this is defined in 5 6 where on sorry i'll i'll, I'll just uh, i'm sorry i'll just come to something which is uh, which is more important with connected with the one which i was just talking now what is the computing of the period of 365 days i i uh, just listed it here that 365 days suppose that 365 days is today and then i challenge that order in the high court and the high court stays that order so the authority does not get time for 365 days the authority can reduce that time of 365 days from the period of limitation of 365 till the time the stay order is in operation by the high court this is in explanation of section 83 i'll just uh, which you can uh, see from the act and now coming to what is uh, sub clause 4 this is the of a section where possession of the property as i told you earlier is still defined where the provisional order of attachment made under 1 of section 5 has been confirmed so once the order is confirmed you are enjoying the property as i told you earlier you are staying there under subject the director in his behalf shall forthwith take the possession of the property so the next step is possession the first step was closing it as uh, attaching it and you are enjoying it but then they take possession possession means you are taken out of the property possession of the property attached in the five or frozen under 4 1f 17 in such manner as may be prescribed provided that if not practical to take possession of property which is frozen under 17 now 17 section just a line here that i'll come to that is only pertaining to the search of place from where the inventory is made whatever is seized from that place so that is uh, frozen in such man, uh, uh, order of confiscation shall have the same effect as if property had been taken possession of now let me come to a very important part section 5 which is very recently amended if you see it is amended on 15th february 2013 with a with a very important thing uh, there was an issue an issue that uh, the part the people who are acquitted a person who is acquitted in the ecir in the case which was pending before the uh, court of the special court that particular person is also absolved of entire liability under the pmla so the legislature in fact 
went ahead to say that our case is not riding on that particular cause of action. Our case is of money laundering and it is a separate offence. It is a code in itself. So we will, because they have a provision in Section 3, which they say that they can immediately uh, pass an order of attachment. So this particular amendment was done where it reads, where on conclusion of trial of an offence under this Act, under this act. The special court finds that offence of money laundering has been committed. It shall order that such property involved in money laundering shall stand confiscated to the central government. This is the bottom line of this particular thing. Now, interestingly, if I may uh, tell you, I came across a very interesting judgment of our own Delhi High Court. This came into existing on 15th April, uh, February 2013. A judgment uh, I read was passed by Arun Delhi High Court on 19 September 2014. The title is Rajiv Chanana versus Deputy Director, Director of Enforcement. Now, this was a writ petition challenged by Rajiv Chanana saying that I have been acquitted in the criminal court, so the properties which you attach are supposed to be released to me. Now, please understand this is very interesting. The amendment had come, but our own High Court very beautifully described that they both are complementary to each other. A prosecution which is based on a schedule offence, when that fails, the PMLA, which is after the schedule offence is committed, a criminal action, a criminal activity is committed, comes into play. How can you? Have that prosecution pending. You must read that judgment which came after the amendment. I thought I will share this with you all. So it is a very important part of uh, PMLA. And uh, I remember appearing in some cases. Uh, let's not name them. But yeah, there have been some matters where after the CBI case uh, uh, fell and uh, we were discharged at the stage of charge, the PMLA, which was the part uh, filed by the ED, the Honorable Special Court was of the view that it cannot stand, this has to go. Now, this happened as late as 2016. So, uh, though uh, the, that particular uh, discharge has been challenged, but it's still pending in the High Court. But what I'm trying to tell you is, the every offence is, is an action which arises out of the schedule offence. So, it has to go till the time. It, uh, so now there are contrary views, but then we have to follow what falls from my lords and lordships. We can't give our own interpretation to that. And uh, so far there are judgments here and there which say some say it should continue, some say it should not continue. So, but let's see if some specific law is taken up by the Honorable Supreme Court and this particular situation is completely put to rest. Now coming to a very important aspect, if the court finds that money laundering has not taken place, then the entire properties are released. Now, here we have to understand one thing, that after this, there are two aspects, releasing or non-releasing. Releasing when you are not convicted, release, uh, not releasing, uh, uh, sorry, releasing when you are not convicted, not releasing when you are convicted. So after conviction, your property is not released, it is confiscated in the next section. Now, please understand, sometimes the ED immediately moves into the appeal. So, in normal procedures, it has been seen that when there's an acquittal and you move for release of properties, and in the case of appeal, the properties in many circumstances are not released, even if there is not a stay order. So, you have to press for it that you have not granted any stay of the order. So, as per this provision, the properties which have been seized, which have been frozen, which have been uh, seized or which have been attached should be released to me. But and at times they are not released even if there is not a stay order. So you have to take aid of this section to come to get your client the properties which have been seized. Now, coming back to coming to uh, section eight. Sorry, after the section eight, we have now one very important aspect in this, which is if a person dies in between or there is an interested person, 
So when a person dies, the director can move an application that the same can be confiscated. And if there is no clement, if there is an interested person, please understand that interested person as per sub clause 8 of section 8 will get complete opportunity, complete opportunity to move his objections, to say what he has to say or to show that he has a right claim and it is not a property which is tainted. So if you read section 8, you will find a complete uh, on that. Now, uh, I will just uh, take you to one more issue, which is uh, section 11. Now, coming to what a criminal lawyer actually Uh, now, if you uh, just have a look at this, these are the powers of the investigating officers, which are the adjudicating authority, to uh, send you summons regarding the production of documents and evidence, which is discovery and inspection, enforcing the attendance of person. Why I want you to read this section is when any person is sent a summon to produce a document or give a statement under all these five formats, please see, this is a power used by the adjudicating authority as per the Civil Procedure Court, which says you can order discovery inspection, you can enforce the attendance, you can compel the production of reports, you can receive evidence on affidavits, you can issue commissions. What is that? If there's a witness who's outside and you and he is unable to come here, you can immediately the this uh, the commission can be instituted and the evidence can be recorded there and any other matter which may be prescribed. Now, please understand section three uh, clause, clause three, which I have written. Every proceeding under this section shall be deemed to be a judicial proceeding. So, what I'm what the legislature mean is that you cannot give false evidence. A it will be hit by 193 and 228 of Indian Penal Court. Secondly, every thing, every particular statement given before the officer shall be, or the authority, sorry, shall be completely admissible in evidence. This is very important for you all to understand. Sometimes we just casually... Uh, people go for giving evidence and you don't prepare them, you don't tell them about all this. They can just go and make any kind of wrong statement, which can be actually counterproductive also. And that particular person can also get involved into a lot of problem because of this particular section. Now, what are the powers available to the investigating officers? Powers which are available to the investigating officers, they can attach the properties. They can conduct surveys, they can do searches in your place, workplace, they can also do searches in the, uh, on the person. All these sections are mentioned along with that. And they can also arrest you if a person is involved into uh, any criminal activity under section 19. So these are the powers of the investigating officers, which, are, which we have cut short so that you can easily understand this that these are the sections where such powers are given to the investigating officers. Now, coming back, now after this, there are two ways. One proceeding starts before the adjudicating authority, which we just read. The second proceeding starts before the court under section 24 of the BMLA. The burden of proof is always on you. This is that particular section, which is very important for us to read. Now, Section 24 says that burden of proof will always be on us. That is the presumption. But there is one line. Please read that. Even if the presumption is against us, against the accused, you read that. In case of the person charged, money laundering shall, unless the contrary is proved, please do not forget this line. Unless the contrary is proved, presume that such procedure crime are involved in money laundering. So you have they, the first Beyond reasonable doubt, proving is resting with the agency. It's the process is the same. They have to first prove their, that they have a case beyond reasonable doubt. Then we have a chance to disprove what is standing against us. 
So unless we first they will prove their case, then we get this is similar to the OS Act. This is similar to the other. Uh, uh, if you read the Evidence Act, one one uh, of the sorry, one one four a, one one four b, one one three a, one one three b for the other offences, the presumption, if it is against you, it will it will first be the job of the prosecutors to prove it. Then we come back and then we get the opportunity to disprove that. So we must understand this. The presumption. It doesn't matter if even if a prosecution start, it doesn't matter that we should not just give up. Oh, there's a presumption against us. No. The first uh, part they have to perform, then it will be our part. Now, coming to section 45, which is the bail section, and a very important section for this act. You see, there have been a lot of uh, discussion on this particular uh, uh, section. The reason is this particular section starts initially had two limbs. One was that you, when you file a bail, when you are in this bail, you will not be given bail unless a public prosecutor is heard. Secondly, you will completely, the judge has to feel that you have not committed an offense, then you get bail. Now, this particular uh, section was challenged in the Honorable Supreme Court by way of uh, five uh, or six petitions, which was headed by Nikesh. Uh, everybody knows about that. I think Nikesh Tarajan Shah. Now, it struck off Section 45.1, saying that you can't have twin issues involved in the thing. You can't have things which are contradictory in the section itself. So, Section 45.1 was declared unconstitutional. And all the people who were not getting bail in a particular offense, which is a scheduled offense, would get bail. Now, it is interesting. I will just tell you an example here. Suppose the scheduled offense says, I'm involved in a case of, let's say, 307, or I'm involved in a case of, let's say, I'll pick up anyone from the scheduled offense, which is, uh, I can go for waging war, I can have uh, culpable homicide, I can have kidnapping or ransom. Now. Initially, it was if I was convicted, if I was facing trial for uh, this particular offense of robbery and uh, there's a proceed of crime, and I get bail in the main case, by, which has been prosecuted by the police, and the offense punishment is more than three years, and I'm not getting bail in 45. So the Supreme Court said, How can you have these kind of contradictory versions? First is the scheduled offense is the offense where the money laundering starts. You are the, the the you are only piggybacking that particular uh, section, and here how can forty five deny bail to a person under trial who is suffering, who gets bail in the main offense, in the main charge, but doesn't get bail here? So forty five was struck off, and thereafter, again, there was an amendment done, which you will uh, just read, which is a very interesting amendment. Now, what was inserted by this amendment? If you just have a look at that. Can I have the amendment, please? Yeah. Now, this says, for the words punishable for a term in prison of more than three years under Part A of the schedule, the words would be sub substituted as, what is it substituted would be? It is substituted as under this act. So, when this particular substitution was done, under this act was added, so what it meant was that no, if an offense is there, we will continue to prosecute you because this is an offense under this act. Now, I would like to inform you, pursuant there too, there have been occasions where the Honorable High Courts of Madhya Pradesh High Court, Bombay High Court, Delhi High Court have taken bail and they have said no. Once the Supreme Court struck off this section, you can't buy the way of this amendment. Come back to us, come back and say, no, this man should not be getting bail. Without naming many cases, I'll just say Upendra Rai is one of them. That's a judgment which uh, clearly uh, speaks about that. That's of Delhi High Court. And even in P. Chidambaram's case, which is a famous case, everybody has gone through it. There is this particular aspect has been discussed. And it was also, I would like to tell you, there was a uh, case which went back to 
Supreme Court and they dismissed it in limine and said, no, you cannot just come here and say, once we have given our mind on the aspect of 45 being unconstitutional and ultra-virus, we don't want to entertain any of this by the ED and it was dismissed in limine. So as on date, it is, again, I must tell you, the ambiguity still survives because the amendment says under this act and the judgment of Nikesh clearly dismisses, clearly quashes the sections 41, 41 as this. Now, this is uh, a little about the bail. And uh, I would like to now just uh, take you, I must tell you that if you really want to be well versed about section 5 and 8 of the uh, PMLA, three important aspects which have been discussed in Seema Gar's case, I would like you to have a look at, which are very important. The Honorable High Court dealt with this as late as March 2020. I would request you all to go through that judgment. So what we have discussed, it will become absolutely clear. Before I conclude on this particular thing, I would like to read the four sex, the four portions of law which have been discussed by the Honorable High Court on that particular aspect. Number one is whether provisional attachment of property is sustainable after the expiry of 90 or 365 days from the date of order passed by the adjudicating authority. The Honorable High Court said, no, 365 days if they are over, you cannot file a complaint against anyone. If the investigation is pending, that's good luck to you. The, uh, it is not possible that you file the complaint. The second taken, uh, question taken was whether property acquired prior to enactment of PMLA, that is one seventh can be provisionally attached in the section five of PMLA. Now this was very important. These are the checklists. Now what happened in some cases, in uh, some matters, in this case only, Seema Garg purchased a property in 1991 and the attachment happened in 2013. So they said you cannot attach this property. And similarly, Seema Garg was not even sent to trial or investigation in this case. You must read this. The Honorable High Court has said that the value of that property, of the proceeds of crime, please understand the word value of the property, of the proceeds of that crime, which is a market value. And if the property is brought abro bought abroad or it is in India, if the property in India can be attached. So this is a very important aspect. You all must understand that this judgment says the property which is in India that can be attached, but for the value of that property, which is the current value of the in the market. And this is an important uh, thing which has come up. The third thing which was taken up was whether phrase value of such property occurring in definition of procedure property includes any property of any person irrespective of source of property. So the High Court has given the uh, 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 observation here that yes, this can be attached for the purpose of only trial. Not for the purpose, if, it, if that in the trial it is found to be a procedure of crime, but for the purpose of value of property, these properties can be attached. But the fourth one was feather officer attaching properties required to record reason. This is very important, which I started with it and I'll conclude from here. That an officer who passes an order of provisional attachment, an officer who passes an order of complete, uh, uh, adju if even adjudicating authority passes an order of confirming the attachment, has to pass an order with complete, reasonable, and we always say not in a mechanical manner. They have to give reasons. They have to be specific. They cannot just pick up words from the section that, oh, look, there it was concealed. It can be frustrated. It can be misused. It can be uh, sold. It, they, these words which are mentioned in the act should not be given. You have to give your own findings to the uh, order why you have come to a conclusion, even for a provisional attachment or even for a uh, attachment confirming that. So, friends, it's a very exhaustive act. And uh, with the time of one hour which was given to me, I uh, I was uh, I was very uh, keen to do uh, other things also about the special court, how the court proceedings are done in the sessions and how you should be representing and things. But I think the first thing which I was told was to enlighten, to discuss with you yeah. all uh, about uh, the um, uh, first thing was what is uh, provisional attachment and then the adjudication. 
So I hope you all understood a little bit of uh, what I tried to make you understand because it also took me time. One thing I would tell you, you all are lawyers, unless and until you do it practically, things you might understand, but when you start doing them practically, you know them inside out. Then you will know judgments by your heart. Then you will know things left right. You don't need to even look to the book. So you must have practical experience with everything. Yes, book knowledge is, is important, but practical knowledge is also extremely important. Yeah, Ajay. Yeah. So, uh, Mr. Mr. Singh, I am so thankful to you for taking this wonderful session. Before we take a question and answer session, um, and let's close the screen, Smriti, uh, for the moment. And first of all, this has been a very wonderful session. Uh, and it has taken more than an hour. Uh, and I have so many questions uh, to, to start asking. But one more thing, which something which we have missed is uh, this. Mr. Mr. Singh also uh, yeah. pointed out that this was a ratio in, in uh, Chanana's case, which is later on set aside in LPA. Set aside in an LPA. What I wanted yes. to say was, in LPA that was set aside by our own high court. Yes. What I wanted to say was, the view came. That look, you cannot circumvent the procedure like that. Our yeah. own High Court had set aside that in an LPA. But my, what I wanted to tell you was the there was a view taken up. Now there are courts which are saying no, you cannot keep the proceedings pending because yeah. in 16. May I request Mr. Singh, sorry to slow down, please. I understand well, a lot of participants who have messaged me in the morning uh, in this sessions that please uh, ask sir to slow down. So when we put the questions, I request you also to uh, answer these questions, right. if, whatever questions, if it's possible. One of the common thing which has been asked by one of the participants is sir. There is no fairness in uh, in the representation when when it is done before the adjudicating authorities, and the the adjudicating authorities becomes like a rubber stamp, and mostly most of the times the lawyers are not properly heard. I do not know whether this is a question. Uh, it's it's a code crafting question, but uh, for the young lawyers and those who want to start practice in PMLA, because the first is starting there from there, there is approaching the adjudicating authority, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, opposing the the uh, the um, order. So th these are the something which uh, one questions which you may answer. And I would I uh, like to answer that, Ajay. It's a very interesting question. Yes, as a young lawyer mm -hmm. and as a lawyer with a standing of about twenty five years. I also feel at times really, uh, you know, upset by some kind of a attitude problem or some kind. sometimes you have, you know, uh, because you feel that you are not being heard. You put across a particular point, they don't hear you and they uh, just try to tell you, no, 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 dismiss, dismiss. This is what the concern of my friend would be right now. But you see, let me tell you one thing. As I started my session, I told you one thing that this act is more of a procedural act. You see. You have to stay within the sections. If you are able to make out a case in the sections which are procedural in nature, there is no way the officer can go beyond the law because Article 41, 141 says you all have to follow what Supreme Court says. So the higher court, we have the lower court has to follow that. So when we pass a judgment, so you see, if for adjudicating authority, the judgment of appellate tribunal is enough. You don't need to even go for the high court. But then, please understand, I'll give you a very important tip here. The moment you feel that your point is not being heard, please move an application. Okay. The, the interesting question uh, is asked is whether a statement recorded by ED, especially incriminatory statement of the accused, are admissible in evidence or not? That's, I said that. I will read that particular line again. Go to section 50. It's a very interesting thing. It, if you say power of authorities regarding summons, 50 uh, sub clause 1 is not applicable, but that is applicable for section 13 sub clause 1. If you read the para 2, sub clause 2 of 50, it says the director shall have power to summon any person whose attendance he considers necessary. Third, all persons who summon shall be bound to attend in person or through authorized agents as such officer may direct shall be bound to speak the truth. Third, every proceeding under subsection 2 and 3 shall be deemed to be a judicial proceeding. So, if you are before an officer, you are on oath, please understand. When you mean a judicial proceeding, it, you mean you are there. So, all proceedings are uh, being uh, taken on oath and you, whatever you say, whatever you write, whatever you make is going to be taken read in favor or against you. 
So, uh, okay. on practical aspects, I wanted to share something. This is the second session on this subject. I would uh, would like to inform that we may have another session on this uh, session because the time was very short. But there is one aspect which is the all the young lawyers are are uh, worrying that this is a special act. What is the procedure will be followed by the special court in during the trial? The sessions uh, uh, court follows the procedure as per the session prescribed procedure of session trial. If you go to CRPC, please open your CRPC if you have it handy with you, and go to chapter number eighteen. Chapter eighteen of CRPC tells you about. the trial before a session court so when you when you read from chapter 8 to uh, 18 the session court trial is prescribed here you go then 2 to 6 come into play you have to argue on charge then charges are framed similarly p is done 313 d is done and then you have the arguments so the session trial is there but yes the situation of session trial the situation at the stage of charge is different as it is before the magistrate they both are completely different so session you have a better scope of uh, giving your points giving your uh, arguments and uh, uh, you uh, and uh, the uh, the procedure the procedure procedure which is prescribed in uh, this particular chapter is applicable here and uh, if you read the pmla also it, these special courts are designated courts and they are designated courts as session courts okay. so the another uh, uh, important as the subject which is here is uh, asked when there is an acquittal in the schedule of offence yeah does it amount to automatic acquittal in the in this proceedings under the pmla yes i had just discussed with you on that you see that that is why the amendment came into place that what initially what used to happen was since 2002 there was no amendment in 13 that amendment came in and that said that uh, the because every offence starts originates from the uh, criminal activity happening in the scheduled offences so they all are mentioned in part a b and c so let's say i get acquitted in ndps case and the schedule offense is ndps and i am pmla is the place where money laundering is being shown and a property is being attached so what they said was look if you are acquitted under this act then those properties shall be released hmm. initially prior to 2013 it used to be a flat case straight you are uh, you are acquitted in uh, the criminal case and then you get out of the pmla right. so this amendment which i just read to you which is mentioned in sub in section 8 yeah. is very uh, very important here that when you get acquitted in the it doesn't matter because they have now amended the word that if you are acquitted under this act so that it confines right. your uh, uh, so acquittal uh, only to this act Yeah. very nice so the another thing which i know you have already uh, talked about this attachment aspects there is a query when there is a joint property or where are people in a in living in a joint property and some one of the uh, co partner of the property who is involved in some uh, allegation with the pmla and if the property can the entire property be attached exactly this is a very good question you see i said in the mean, in the middle i think you uh, must have uh, heard one of my lines when i said the value of property if i have a property in let's say jorbag and that is 100 crores and the money laundering is alleged against me for 10 crores and i am a 50 percent owner so 10 crore is the only portion which should be attached now here i will add one more line here now my share is 50 percent so they can only attach 10 percent of my share which is the value of the property at that time this is what the judgment of our delhi high of uh, uh, our uh, appellate tribunal says delhi uh, where the judgment is there i can share that judgment with you it's a very interesting one that the value of property will be only uh, sh- uh, only uh, that particular amount can be put in where the value of property let's say the value of property is 100 crores and you are challenging me 10 crores you can't say that this property was purchased in 2000 uh, 2000 and that time the value of the property was 10 crores so now we are attaching the entire contain crores no they can only go into 50 crore 50% of my share that's number 1 number 2 if the case of the money of the ed is of 10 crores they will attach only 10 crores in that property they can't attach the other share that's number 1 number 2 another question which has come in i'll add one to here that let's say i'm a director in a company which is a very important thing here and i am alleged to be 
uh, involved into money laundering case and the company i'm a directed in director in that company has a property in uh, connaught place now the question is the case falls on me can the property in connaught place be attached no because that com- property is of the company not of the director so this also has been held so by the cannot be treated as a proceed of crime exactly it is not my uh, property it has to be it is very specific now if that is what i'm saying the value of the property the value of the charge against me the value of the property has to be the current value it cannot be a value back in time because you all remember in 87 85 all sale deeds are about 1 lakh 10 lakhs 15 lakhs and now every ed case is 10 crores 50 crores 100 crores so the value of the property has also increased manifold it has gone from 10 lakhs to now 150 crores so okay. that has to be so taken i have into. i have another question and i think it is a very very hot question because we have so many people from the real estate industry uh, also as a client uh, of my colleague uh, ajay can i just a minute can i just uh, give the name of the judgment if you please, guys go ahead please go ahead yeah the judgment of the uh, appellate authority is alpha avenue private limited versus deputy director this was in 2014 which talks about value to be calculated as current market value and not the uh, purchase value and this is very important for you guys and this judgment is a very detailed judgment and another judgment which i'd like you guys to read is uh why is jagan mohan reddy versus joint director this is also of the appellate uh, tribunal tribunal it's a very amazing judgment this will tell you about shares of the person can be attached the the main company's properties cannot be attached you can attach what belongs to the person who is involved in money laundering if the company is involved yes please do it but if the company is not involved and i am a person who has been uh, uh, charged cheated or uh, been uh, tried for any offense here that, that this would be the scenario these two judgments are very important very nice. and another one judgment which i like you all to go through is of the apple why i am giving you appellate authority judgment because then you can take up from here now this particular judgment of uh, uh, it says uh, that the uh, there is a basic uh, sometimes we are uh, we go through all this that when can be physical possession be taken let's say i the, my uh, i am convicted or my uh, adjudicatory authority says uh, the order is confirmed and they come for possession so can they immediately come and throw me out no if you remember i re- read a section with you that if i fail if they uh, if there is an order of uh, if the order is confirmed by the adjudicating authority the possession can be taken under 84 the now the very important part here is the rules of pmla they say 10 day notice has to be given to the person by the adjudicating authority to vacate the premises and i need i get 30 days to challenge that order before the appellate tribunal so that i can get a stay on that this is very important uh, because we have you have to relate with the uh, the possession immediately cannot be taken so you guys must understand this also yeah ajay so so the one of the important uh, query which is i think uh, a couple of people have asked is this that in a real estate industry for a developer uh, it's it sometime it is possible that the person who has booked a, a flat or a unit has paid the amount uh, and this later on found that this could be uh, possible from the proceed of crime now that person is booked and given a 50% amount at the time of of and and when the, the developer wants the full payment to hand over the possession but the authorities want the entire attachment so in, in that light what is what is your view on this that this partial pay proceed of crime came he was not even aware and then he has to lose the entire property you see this is a very interesting aspect a lot of things are happening as i said earlier when you go to the uh, what is money laundering in the third it is integration integration is placing your money in uh, real estate into gold or into other valuable assets this is the integration what has been done after the money reaches the prop- the country now when somebody places his money in the project and as and books let's say 10 flats correct please understand those 10 flats have a particular value you have to relate everything to three things directly and indirectly involved and value of the property which i read to you in the beginning and we showed you a slide also now value of the property now let's say i have put in 1 crore each 
for five flats, which which may come comes to five crores. And then the builder asks me to give the remaining payment, and suddenly he receives a notice that I am attaching the building. That attachment is wrong because the ED is only confined confining. It has to confine itself to those five plots flats where the money has gone. Because they are saying that proceeds of crime are these, not the entire project. If there are hundred uh, unsecured creditors, they have nothing to do with the proceeds of crime. How can their project be shelved or attached? And the uh, and, uh, and please understand, confiscation, possession, and confiscation are the next steps. So, if the money is proved to be a money coming out of proceeds of crime, those five flats from that project are attached first. Then, if it is confirmed, it is confiscated, it's taken possession of, and then it is confiscated to the central government. It is not that the project is stopped. So, if any such order is passed by the authority, that is liable to be challenged. And I'm sure if this is the exact topic, their relief will be given. Okay. Thank you. I, I think uh, with this, uh, uh, there is a few suggestions have been asked. You have been a good mentor. I think they all of you, uh, all of the young lawyers, uh, look forward for you as a mentor. And as a result, they need to know that what are the good suggestions for commentaries and 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 research preparations uh, for making their good in their cases. Um, you see, I have been uh, always a very big uh, fan of hard working. And uh, I've always believed there's no alternative to hard work. And uh, if uh, my juniors are there or if my colleagues are there, people who have worked with me or people I have been associated with, there would be many people. In Delhi, I'm really very uh, lucky to be you know, uh, friends with people like Ajay and very senior lawyers of our high court. I don't want to name them because there will be, I might miss one or two and that will create anger at the fraternity. You see, friends, let me tell you something. My, when I got my license to practice my, I went to my dad and I, uh, as a matter, I'm a Punjabi, so we pair hat lagate hain log. And I hugged my dad and he said, uh, uh, "Beta, yaad rakhna, law is lawyer's paradise." Please understand this line. Law is lawyer's paradise. He told me that, listen, you are the one who has to create your case. The judge only has read your file. You have to make your case. And your good argument should be the first argument. And always go with an alternative relief in mind. Please remember, my friends, look, when I say this line, law is lawyer's paradise, it means you are the one who is the creator of the case. If somebody comes to you, you have to create the defense. You have to create the law. You have to see the topic. You have to make the questions. You have to, if you're doing trial, you have to make cross-examination. If you're doing appeals or revisions or 482s, you have to pick up points. And I will tell you one thing. Delhi High Court is blessed with one of the best judges in the country. We also have to see that when you argue or anywhere in the country, I have been, uh, you know, very uh, privileged and, uh, you know, very honored, very... Uh, I humbly say that I've been to many high courts in the country and they've been awesome. And uh, the, the, everywhere, what has been appreciated is a question of law. Facts are secondary. If you can make your case on law, that's one. Please mix your facts thereafter. First, read the section, understand its implication, read your case, mix the merits of the case and see where you are fitting in law. And then go and argue. And please understand one thing. Never go halfly prepared. It would be a half-baked cake. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Singh. I think we, we have all, already closed a lot of time. Uh, the only thing, well, last question, very quickly, if you can comment. The interrelation between the IBC and the PMLA. I was expecting that. This is uh, an interesting PMLA is Fund Prevention of Money Laundering Act, and the IBC is, as you all know, Insolvency and Banking Code. Now, what is that? Insolvency and Banking Code, then we have a separate forum altogether, NCLT, NCLT, and here we are dealing with PMLA. Now, here I would like to just sum up with a very beautiful uh, interconnect with both of them. You see, some properties are attached by, let's say, NCLT by virtue of an application by a secured creditor. 
Now, I am sure everybody knows what a secure creditor is. Secure creditors are the financial banking institution, NBFCs or NBFCs, people who fund. And unsecured creditors are, creditors, creditors are like us, who are uh, people who are investing in the projects. We are unsecured. If we are uh, a lot in a, uh, if in a project, we are unsecured. So what I'm trying to tell you is, if that particular property is attached by the NCLP, and if the PMLA passes an order, adjudicating authority, that we are attaching that property, now, this is a confusion which is created these days, where it is none. The judgments are to the effect, I will give you a few names, where they have said, whatever happens, if the attachment is there, first the secure creditor has to be fulfilled, his claim, and then it will go there. You all must be aware of a judgment of our own Delhi High Court in Axis Bank's case. I won't name uh, the judgment. What happened in that judgment, our high court had held that the first PML level, because the special act, PML level take privilege, privilege over on the uh, NCLT's order. But the Honorable Supreme Court was of a different view. I'll just like to assist you on that, tell you on that. There is a one project here. An SLP was filed by the Axis Bank and the particular order has been stayed. Now, this is one of the orders which was passed by uh, Delhi High Court in that SLP. And I want to give you one or two judgments. Uh, this is an SLP page, one page. Yeah. That's fine. So if, you, if you guys can see this, uh, this is the uh, SLP number 28986 of 19. This is Access Bank versus Enforcement, where the Honorable Supreme Court has maintained status quo on the order. And there were other bunch of petitions like that which had gone. All banks had gone, so that is stayed. Now, I'm giving you a few judgments, if you uh, feel like, where it says ED cannot attach property of corporate debtors, which is undergoing resolution process. Please understand. It cannot say, oh, we have a uh, over uh, edge over that. Second issue is mortgage properties acquired by banks First, the banker, secure creditors have to be fulfilled, and then further it will take uh, care of that. One of the judgment is, if you can um, note down, it is GSW Steel Limited versus Mahinder Kumar, and the second judgment is PMT Machines versus Deputy Director. And of all, both these issues, what we just discussed, have been elaborately discussed on that. Thank and you. one is by the uh, uh, Appellate Tribunal Insolvency Court, mm -hmm. one is by our own uh, Appellate Tribunal PMLA. Okay. Thank you. I think with this, we will like we would like to conclude the session. And I'm thankful to Mr. Singh for taking up so pain and preparation of the session. And uh, for all the participants, I would like to inform you that this is a series initiated by the International Bridges to Justice India, along with the Criminal Justice Group. The idea is to have a effective criminal defense practice. And we, we are having another sessions tomorrow with Mr. C Sadat Utra, senior advocate on uh, uh, on revisiting the evidence rules relating to evidence in civil and criminal uh, cases and day after tomorrow we have a session with Mr. Ramesh Gupta, senior advocate on the misuse of 156.3 and 173.8 CRPC. Thank you everyone. All guys for being here. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Thank you Ajay. Thank you.